Good evening. A very warm welcome uh, to, to all of you, whether you've come from far or nearby. It's amazing to see so many of us joining in worship, scattered to this place from so far away from where Jesus lived and taught. I I'm Pesh. I've been part of the All Souls Church family for 12 years now, and it's a great privilege to be able to open God's word with you this evening. The icebreaker question was, have you ever been out of your comfort zone? I, I wonder what sort of things came to mind. Around this time last year, I was very much out of my comfort zone. My sister was getting married, and she'd asked some of her friends and family to do a Bollywood-style dance for her reception. At the risk of embarrassing myself, here are a few photos of me attempting to do that dance. D dancing definitely isn't one of my strengths. I was told that I could sort of do the moves in time, but, but have a look at my face. I was concentrating so hard on doing the moves that I looked furious. <laughs> now, busting out those choreographed moves, or indeed any moves on any dance floor, is well outside my capability. But actually, as I was doing it, I felt this sense of peace. I felt that I was at home. You see, I was with my family. I was doing this for my sister. I'm very fortunate to have a loving and caring family, and I knew that a misstep, or indeed having a face that looks like that, none of that would affect my status as a loved son, as a loved brother. That there's a real sense of that here in 1 Peter. Have a look down in verse 1. It says, to God's elect, exiles. We as Christians, on the one hand, are exiles, and as such, we're out of our comfort zones. But amazingly, we are also elect. We are chosen by God. We're in the first of a mini-series uh, of three talks in 1 Peter, um, and, and as I've been preparing, I've been struck by how Peter's message is both deeply encouraging, but also deeply challenging. Uh, as we open up this letter, it's worth uh, a look at the context. Why was Peter writing? You can see the reason that Peter writes in 5 verse 12. He says, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you, and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. Peter is writing to a community of Christians who are facing suffering and persecution. Uh, they're scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And he's writing to them to encourage them to stand fast in God's grace and cling on to the hope that comes with that. That message was relevant to them then, but it's just as relevant to us in London in 2024. Why should we listen to Peter? Well, Peter is uniquely qualified to teach this message. He was one of the 12. He lived alongside Jesus and, and was an eyewitness to his ministry. But he's an expert. Peter has seen both sides. He knows what it is to duck suffering by avoiding standing firm in his faith. But he's also stood firm in his faith. He, he ducked suffering when, on the night of Jesus' arrest, uh, before Jesus was crucified, he denied knowing Jesus three times in fear of what punishment he would face. But he also stood firm and preached the gospel faithfully in Acts chapter 4 and 5, and he suffered as he did so. He was flogged and he was imprisoned. Uh, and look, whether you've had a restful summer and you're now rearing to go, or you've had a tough one and you're tired, whether you're just looking into the Christian faith or you've been following Jesus for many years, Whatever your situation, there will be something for you in these verses in 1 Peter. We're only looking at the first two verses today, but they're packed full of so much truth about who God is and who we are in light of that. Have a look at the first verse. Uh, and this is my first point. We are chosen. It says within those verses, to God's elect. As Christians, it is our belief that we have been chosen by God. And this is a remarkable thing that it's quite easy to gloss over, but I want us to dwell in it. And it's exactly why the Christian message is such good news. God, because of his love for us, pours out his grace in choosing us, in electing us. Why is it so remarkable? Well, it's remarkable because we are not good enough for God. There is no Christian who is good enough by their own merit. In chapter 4, verse 3, it says that we have spent enough time in sin, doing what the pagans do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Maybe you think that you're not that bad against Peter's list. But actually, 
we are all by nature sinners. That includes me, and it includes you. When I first heard the Christian message, I used to think that was pretty offensive, actually. You know, I'm not that bad, am I? And I'm certainly better than that person over there. But the more I examine my heart, the more I realize that I'm a sinner. I replaced worship of God with other things. That, that's what that word idolatry is all about. And I was living my life by my rules rather than his. You see, we all worship something. If it's not God, it's probably something else, whether it's money or power or relationships or experiences. And in replacing God with those things, we don't deserve to be chosen. It's also remarkable because God's grace saves us from death to eternal life. Our sin deserves punishment, but amazingly, we have received mercy. In chapter 2, verse 10, it said, once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And in chapter 5, verse 10, we see that the God of all grace, who has called you to eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore you. You see, without God choosing us, we'd be destined for death. But with God, we're granted eternal life. It's also remarkable because it relies fully on grace. Chapter 1, verse 13 says, Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. You see, all you have to do to be elected is to repent and believe. This is the amazing nature of grace, and it's what marks Christianity out from other religions and philosophies. You see, no amount of good deeds are enough to be saved by God and to be chosen by him. On the flip side, and, and this is amazing, no amount of bad deeds are too much to be covered by his grace. It has all been achieved by Jesus, by his death on the cross. All we have to do is to accept his gift, to admit our guilt and to trust in God. And if we do that, then we can join the elect. It's also remarkable because as chosen people, our salvation is secure. It says in 1 verse 5 that through faith, we are shielded by God's power. Nothing at all can separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus. No suffering, no persecution, no situation we find ourselves in. That we are chosen by God is remarkable. It's remarkable because we're not good enough for God. It's remarkable because it saves us from death to eternal life. It's remarkable because it relies on grace alone. And it's remarkable because our salvation is secure. That, that idea of being chosen by God, also called divine election or predestination, can lead to a couple of questions that I want to just briefly address. Some people ask, is it fair? You know, election means that God has chosen some, but not others. Surely that's unfair, isn't it? But, but that line of questioning forgets that God didn't have to choose anyone. Nobody deserves to be chosen on the basis of their actions. So the fact that he chooses anyone at all is truly amazing. Other people ask, what role does that leave for us? You know, if, if God is doing the choosing, if, does that mean that we're power, powerless in all of this? Now, now, it is true that God is all-powerful, but it's also true that one of the ways that God reveals himself to others is through his people. So as those who are elect, it's on us to speak about him and to reflect his goodness to the world. That's our calling. And to those who are finding out about Christianity, it's also true that God has put the right things and the right people in your life, but you're still called to respond by repenting and believing. So we're chosen. My second point is that we're exiles. Peter isn't just talking about being exiled geographically, uh, but as Christians living in this world, we should feel out of our comfort zones. We should feel like exiles in this world in that we don't fit in. After all, we live as those whose citizenship is in heaven rather than on earth. We, we will be exiles maybe in our workplaces, maybe in our schools, uh, maybe in our families, maybe in our friendship groups. And when we stand up for our beliefs, when we stand up for God, when we stand up for the oppressed, that can leave us feeling isolated from the world. We'll start to face opposition. 
And there are two main senses in which, uh, which we see that in these verses in, in, in 1 Peter uh, and the verses that follow. Firstly, we see that exiles have a living hope. H- have a look at 1 Peter 1 verse 3. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish spoil or phase. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. You see, this, this living hope that Peter talks about it is, is more than a hope in the sense of, I hope that the weather's going to be good. It is a certain expectation of something we know to be true in the future. Christians who focus on this living hope, on the inheritance that is promised to us, will be joyful people. We'll have a joy that doesn't depend on circumstance or on situation. And that will mark us out as being different in the world. Now, I don't mean to diminish the pain and anguish of suffering at all. We all know that Jesus wept as he saw the sin of the world. And it is right to grieve and to be filled with sorrow as we face trials, as loved ones suffer, as persecution comes on us or the wider church. And there'll be many of you here today who will be in that situation But the difference with Christians is that we grieve clinging on to this living hope in the full knowledge that one day God will make all things right and we have that inheritance kept in heaven for us that will never perish, spoil or fade. We'll hear more about that hope and joy next week when Phil preaches on being rejoicing newborns. Secondly, as Christians, as exiles, we are called to obedience Have a look at uh, chapter 1, verse 15. It says, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. Just pause on that for a minute. We're called to be as holy as Jesus himself, the man who lived a perfect, sinless life. A A summary of that obedient and holy life is to love God with all our heart and our mind and our soul, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. But being obedient in that way is completely out of our comfort zones. It's out of our comfort zones because it's in our nature to be sinful. And we'll find it hard to change our ways. It will require sacrifice. But it's also out of our comfort zones because as we do that, we'll be going in a very different direction to the non-Christians around us. Living that sort of distinct life leads to being noticed and it leads to opposition. Have a look at what it says in chapter 4, verse 4. It says they, that's the non-Christians, are surprised that you do not join with them in their reckless, wild living, as they, uh, and they will heap abuse on you. We may have experienced that sort of thing in London, but it's a serious issue throughout the world. It's estimated by an organization called Open Doors that 360 million Christians worldwide, that's one in seven Christians, face discrimination and persecution for their beliefs. Obedience also means telling people about the Lord Jesus, who is the ultimate source of our hope. Have a look at what it says in 3 verse 15. It says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you uh, for for the hope that you have. Don't deny Jesus as Peter did on the night of Jesus' arrest but instead stand firm and proclaim his name. You see, being uh, an exile, being an exile will require us to put our necks above the parapet. And as we do so, we'll face opposition. But, But that is our calling as exiles. Being an exile, being out of our comfort zone, might not sound that great. It might sound a bit difficult. But it is possible for us. And it's possible for us because we're not alone in it. We have God on our side through all the trials and tribulations that we might face. Which leads to my third point, which is that we are chosen by the Trinity. Now, I don't know how you feel about hugs, but when I was a teenager, I used to think hugs were a bit uncool. So anytime someone would hug me, I'd sort of squirm away from them. But as I I grew up, I've come to appreciate them. And verse 2 is a bit like a big old hug. It's a three-way hug from the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. It's a big hug that comforts us when we feel like exiles in this world. 
It's a big hug that reminds us of who we've been saved by when things start to go wrong. Before we explore that a bit more, a short word on the Trinity. As Christians, we have one God in three persons. Each of the Father, Son, and Spirit are fully God, but they're distinct from one another. There aren't three gods, but one God in three persons. It's a complex idea, and we may never fully get, 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 get to grips with it, but that's okay, because God is a lot, lot bigger than us. And really, the main thing that we need to get from this passage is that God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son are all for us, and they are all involved in our salvation. So, so let's see the role of each uh, through these verses. We see that we've been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the, Fer- of God the Father. He knew who, who, who he was going to choose before the creation of the whole world. Each and every one of us who are chosen, he knew each of them before the creation of the whole world. And there's incredible security in that, isn't there? That it isn't down to our own performance, our education, our careers, where we're from, how good we've been or how bad we've been. But it's all in God's choice. It's also incredibly humbling. If we're chosen by God, then we have no right to think of ourselves as any better than anyone else. We also see that we're chosen through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Sanctifying is a Bible word for becoming more holy or becoming more like the Lord Jesus. We talked earlier about the calling to be holy as the one who has called us to be holy. And we simply can't do that in our own strength. Amazingly, God doesn't just leave it to us to figure it out, but he sends his spirit. The spirit works in our hearts, a bit like a personal trainer, to reveal where we're going wrong and to help us correct those wrongs. It's an ongoing process in the life of a Christian. If you're struggling with or if you're fighting with with sin, then I want you to be encouraged. It's a sign that the Holy Spirit is working within you. Lastly, we see the role of the Lord Jesus. We see that we're chosen to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Now, it's important to get this idea of obedience straight in our heads. We can be tempted to think of obedience a bit like the terms and conditions of grace. You know, yes, there's grace, but then there's also all these things about obedience. But it's not that at all. Grace is freely given, and it doesn't rely on obedience. Rather, obedience is a natural response to grace. If if you're chosen by God, if you have a living hope, then you're freed from living a sinful life. And more than that, in knowing God's love, you'll want to be obedient to the one who saved you. And and that's where the second half of the phrase comes in. We we know and we can be completely secure that that we've been saved because of the sprinkling of Jesus' blood. You see, God is a perfect God, and he can't leave sin unpunished. In, In the Old Testament, that's why there was a whole system of sacrifices where animal sacrifices would take the place of judgment that the Jewish people rightly deserved. But but the problem was that no amount of animal sacrifice could take on that burden. That's why Jesus had to die on the cross, to once and for all take the punishment that we deserve, not just for the Jews, but for the whole world. Jesus, God himself, the only one who lived a perfect life, the Lamb of God, he was who could take away the sin of the world. So as those who who have been sprinkled with Jesus' blood, we're protected from God's wrath and anger on us, and so we can be confident in our salvation. But being chosen by God is the comprehensive work of God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son. What does all of that mean for us? The fact that we've been chosen is remarkable. We're chosen to be exiles, living in hope and obedience. And and we're chosen by the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. For for those of you who are looking into the Christian faith, I hope that you will see the security and joy of the love of God. I I pray that one day you'll accept his grace and meet God in that choice of you. For for those of you who, who who, who know you're chosen, I hope it means that you will be encouraged. I hope that you will feel that security and love of God. 
God the Father who chose you before the creation of the world. God the Spirit who continues to make us holy day by day. And God the Son who secured our salvation with the sprinkling of his blood. In light of that encouragement, have confidence to stand firm in your faith. Have the confidence to proclaim the reason for your hope and have the confidence to be obedient. At the start of this new academic year, it would be great for you to reflect on what that might look like for you. And if you're in the midst of trials at this time, then look to that loving embrace of the God who loves you and has chosen you for renewed strength. Whatever is going on in your lives, have a look at what Peter ends with. He says, grace and peace be yours in abundance. May that be true for you, safe in the knowledge that God has chosen you. As the band comes up, let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for choosing us before the creation of the world through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, sprinkled with the blood of his Son. Help us to live as your elect and as exiles, in obedience to you, living as those with living hope. In your name we pray. Amen.